really just want to say to people who me, hey, it's a nice place and I really like it. Do you to say that? Yeah. Okay, the other thing I want to do is I want to thank the previous presenters. They're all professional and very well done and so forth. I'm an ex-fisherman, kind of a hairy-ass kind of guy, so I can't help it. I said, I spent my daughter to BCIT, spent 10,000 bucks to teach me how to do that. So let's see if we can make it work. <laughs> All right, uh, so what I want to do today is something a little different here. So let's go. All right. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll have this here. Actually, I taught night school in PCIT. I don't need a mic, you know, I just, you know, wake up in the back there, you guys. <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> and the student replied, I'm so broke, I can't even pay attention. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is, uh, this is when you get the $10,000. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to, I'm going to really dwell a little bit on the old days because I'm an old guy, but it might be useful for you. Uh, but I want to talk about the actors in the Harry Brown, about what, what really goes on and who are the influence makers, what and so forth. The other thing I want to do is take a brief look at some of the issues. And some of them are obvious from the presentations we've had before. Okay, and the final result, you should have some knowledge. So there's no exam, so you can relax. Is this on the final? Oh, give me some glitz. See, I'm just doing this. For the 10,000 bucks, we've got to have something. <laughs> this slide has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> okay, Grant, I know you want your money's worth here, so. <laughs> so let's get going. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and Grant told me, no sex, no violence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, me. Come on. All right, there you are. That's how I made my fortune. My first fortune. My second fortune was, uh, well, I'm independently wealthy. Uh, it means my wife works. <laughs> so this means a beach man at Blinkhorn. Famous set, Grant knows it very well. You see that little stump there? I'm going to get this little thing I got in my pocket here somewhere. I'm left-handed, so I never know where things are. Okay, so, so that's me. I'm a Canadian, you can tell. That's a personal flotation device, which you have to have. Gloves for my delicate hands. Uh, sunglasses, so I don't. Now, this stump is a tie-up stump. That's what we use. This is a salmon fishery. I've tied to that stump for the last 50 years, so I don't know what the hell that means. But, there's a couple of things you might be noticed. See those grooves? That's how long that stump's been there. This is a strap, and this here, Grant knows what this is. That's called a Norwegian handshake, or the magic knot. Here's what happens. See this little line here? Down there is that bozo skiff man, and when it's time to let go, he just pulls on that line and it all releases. Fabulous, talk about science. Anyhow, me. I raised an alert bay, and now I gotta give you a quick alert bay story. Okay, just quick. A man is, was told by his doctor that he was dying terminal. It's all over. The guy said, anything you can do? The guy said, well, maybe you can move to Alert Bay. Should I live longer? Uh, no, but it'll seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a load of money fishing went to a whole bunch of universities with various degrees of success. Big deal. But then I went to the mysterious East. I worked in Ottawa for 10 years. So if you have any questions on the closure of the whaling fishery, I was involved in that. The Area Forex haddock quota problem, you know about that. The Irish moss problem, that's why your chocolate milk doesn't uh, separate, it's carrageenan. What else did I do? Oh, all sorts of other stuff. If you read my resume, you wonder why I ever slept. Okay, so I, but I fished forever. I finally figured out BCIT the last 15 years was great because we had the summers off, went fishing. So I fished forever. Oh, and I've got my book here. This is a great commercial plug. My book is over here. 20 bucks. Cash only, please. I have to sell it. Okay, that's me. 
So what are we going to do? So what I'm going to talk about, history of the early days, might be boring for you, but it's in my consciousness and I have to share it. Talk about the role Hindu herring industry. Want to talk, which is important for you, I think, the actors in the drama. And then, what are the issues? Okay. This is the only graph you'll ever need. The only one you'll ever need. This tells the whole story. Well, almost. Look. Here we go. Why isn't that other? Right. Pump with a light. Okay, there, there is the catch, and there is the spawners. Okay, so here we have, right here, lots of spawners, not much fish. Now, here is where I was involved. I helped wipe out the fishery. For this <laughs> I helped, we were good at it. And I'll explain what happened. But here's a little synopsis of what happened with that draft show. And look at that, for 10 grand, you get that. Reduction fishery wiped up the stocks. Row fishery emerged. We have a new licensing regime, and this is important. I'll talk about that a little later. Here's the word you're going to hear. IDQ, Individual Vessel Quota. So each same boat this year gets 61 tons. So that's his quota. But we'll talk about that a little later, not in great detail. Now the other thing that's happened in the industry, which is kind of by the by, not important perhaps, but technological change. And let me explain. Oh, and in addition, DFO invented a new process, which we'll see. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you like that? Do you want to do it again? <laughs> okay, here's a reduction fishery in the good old days. Low prices, low technology, no sonar. No sonar. Where are the fish? Where are the birds? You know, that's how we did it. And a reduction fishery, the life and death of Namu. I don't know if you've ever been to Namu, but it was that big reduction plant in the cold storage. And when I was 20, we went there to fish. <coughs> oh, it's heaven. 150 women working in the cannery. I'm a teenage boy from Alert Bay, my God. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's the good old days. That's Fisherman. That's a Western warrior. Skipper was, had a great name, Johnny Goodlad. What a great name. Okay, now here is the old technology. The old technology. <coughs> and uh, you can see here something interesting. You look closely. You know what that is, and you look over here. Street lamps. This is how we pit lamped. So we had the normal sailing technique, which you know about, the normal brailing technique, and they know all the normal stuff, but we had a technique to wipe out the fishery. So this is the boat I worked on, the Van Isle, the old Van Isle, and uh, my bunk was, I think, right there. And I used to play skipper up here. Uh, my job was to be on the wheel. What does that mean? Well, what these boats would do, as opposed to here, where the boats come to where the fish are spawning, we didn't do that. We had to find them. So, what we had was a technique to do it. Now, let's hope we can do it here. My boat. Too many things. Okay. We use a paretic power block, which that's jargon, you don't need this. It's not even an exam. We now use a drum scene, but in those days we used a power block. We had the Echolite sounder, which is a paper sounder. It used to tick away over here, and all it did was give a black mark. Sort of like a seismograph. You know when they show you the earthquake things? Well, that's how it worked. Okay, we got two bucks a ton. Two dollars a ton. But, look, my share, two bucks a ton, a hundred, you can do the math in your head, you all remember. <laughs> two hundred bucks a trip. That was sixteen hundred bucks a trip. Two trips a week, we're in Clover. So we made a load of money. I made it, in those days when I went to university, shuttered, no student loans. And I kept failing courses and so forth, no scholarships, no bursaries, <laughs> had to use my own money, but that's okay. Sometimes I had enough money I could drink in the Cecil three nights a week. But though, some of you may remember the Cecil. Okay, so next. There's a photo I threw in, it's pretty, Junkie. Why do I put it there? Because I have it. It's the only photo I have of that 
several years I fished on the Van Isle, the only time. And I piled these corks. And uh, pretty nice job, eh? Looks nice. Look, look how symmetrical they are. Look at that. You know how nice. Okay, power skiff. Dead skiff. And I'm going to teach you how to pit lamp. A little summary, just to remind you, where are we? <coughs> Reduction fishery, you know that. Row fishery, you know that. After the collapse, as Tony pointed out this morning, after the collapse of the stocks. Price collapse after the death of the emperor. And now, so this is the summary. But I want to go back in the space-time continuum and put the mic down and give you a demonstration of pit lamping. And I'll act out all the parts right here. Now, here's how we did it. No fish. What do we do? It's a light, boys. So we're looking for a dark, dark, dark night. And then we go and drop the hook. That's anchoring, I guess, in parlance. We call it dropping the hook. Maybe you do too. Then we turn on the lights. Then we turn on the lights with a little Honda, cheap Honda generator in the dead skiff. And we turn those lights on. And then we shut down everything. Noise is our enemy. And the skipper says, okay, boys, go to bed till midnight. So at midnight, we get up and we take a look. And we can see the fish around or whatever. And if we think there's enough fish, we're going to set. Now, it's darker in the inside of a cow, you know, in the middle of nowhere. But we're going to do it because we want the money. So we leave the chain below because that chain and the chalk, it's just the worst noise for herring. They're gone. Okay, now we got the anchor up. We're, the fish are at the lights. Now we've got to get away from the fish so we can catch them. <laughs> so we turn out the lights on the big boat. And then <laughs> the, sk the skipper's nephew, who ran the skiff, and he used to be very vulgar. He said, tell that a-hole to let go. <laughs> he hated him, but that's another story. So we leave the dead skiff with the lights, free, floating around, and then we put the clutch in oh so gently and just give her a little bit of power and we sneak away from the fish. And once we're away from the fish, Skipper has got a little handle thing. Boop! We let the net go. And around we go, circle around the dead skip with the lights. And that's how we did it. It worked like a Swiss watch. Now, what's the problem? Wipe up the herring. Wiped out the immature sockeye or springs. We'd get hake, we'd get pollock, whatever. So it was very efficient. We loved it, but we know the result. Wiped out the herring. So it's now illegal. <clears throat> but, but just as a little personal note, some things are legal and some things are illegal if they're illegal by law, and some things aren't. Translation when we fish sardines, we fish sardines. I said, hey boys, I know how to catch them late at night. We would pit lamp. Not legal, but then not illegal. Fish forgot about it. You know, they hadn't a 40-year-old memory like me. So, if you ever have to pit lamp Harry, give me the call, okay? <laughs> so I can give you that. Why? Because, well, I think it's useful. Not very, but here we go. Well, that's what we just did. That was the demonstration. I did all the parts. I didn't give you the, all the parts, but most of them anyhow. We wiped out the herring, as you know. We caught the salmon. Take a watch. on the fishery. As you know, you saw all the slides. And demo, yeah, well, that was me. Okay. Now, the early fishery was everyone for themselves. Dog eat dog. They call it the Klondike, like meaning a coal rush. So when we first started the fishery, it was every man from South, so we, you know, get my way, I'll ram you, you so and so. Oh, okay, that's the kind of fishery it was. But it was too crazy, it was too wild, so fisheries put in a system of IBQs, individual vessel quota. That means you got your share, it was allocated to you. Now, out here when you see the fishery, 
fishing. Each seine got a 60 ton quota. Well, that's not enough to make money. 50 quote tons only filled our back hatches. So they invented company pools and stacking. So what you did, you had, we call them armchair or slipper skippers. Translation, they're sitting at home watching family food or whatever, but they lease out their quota. So we had a whole bunch of owners of licenses who never fish. They just sell them. Now what's happened in this fishery out here is a lot of guys are going to lose money because they bought these licenses from the armchair guys on the calculation that, okay, we've got four licenses, that's 240 ton. You can do the math. Did you do that? 60? That's four? 240? Got it? Okay, but he only catches 80, 90 ton. He's lost money. There's bad stuff going to happen because of this fishery in the economics. So the stacking, the way to stack really is, I'll pay you for your 60 ton quota only if I catch them. But some people miss that little step. So, stacking, there are 250 licenses, only about 50 boats fish. <laughs> Here's a story, okay? I think it's funny. When we were running the sardine fishery, I get a phone call, this guy said, I want to go fishing, how do you do it? And I said, blah, 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 here's how we do it, because I was the manager of the fishermen in the sardine fishery. And he says, how do we do it? So I told him, so afterwards I asked one of the skippers, how come he's fishing? He said, well, he lost a whole bunch of money in the Gillnet Row fishery. He owns Jimmy Patterson 40,000 bucks. So he's the lousiest fisherman, so they can let him fish. So that's the rule. The worse you are as a fisherman, the more the probability you will fish. Huh? The logic escapes me. All right. Okay, this is it. This is the killer machine. It's called the Prosperity. I fished on her for 15 years, right from when she was new to 2005. And my partner, Byron, did something I didn't like. He went up and died. And I lost my job, my old friend. So he was a killer fisherman. And I want to talk about this boat a little bit. Um, they, what can I say? You will not believe how technologically advanced that machine is. I trained that boat to go from Steveston to Prince Rupert all by itself. What? That's right. You just got the little uh, autopilot, and every time you change course, hit the button. That's a waypoint. Not a technical problem. You know, we're on the satellite. You know, it's always looking for the signal. You know. <coughs> Skip it. Turn that damn thing off. We've got a big snake following us. But what I'm pointing out here is the technology is unbelievable. Now, on this boat, we did everything double. Two sonars. One that looked about five miles away. The other one only up short to find the fish. Two sonars. One narrow beam. You like all this stuff? You know, you're taking notes. One wide beam. Two sonars. Two radars. Ten radios. Ten radios? Well, in this world, you have to stand by on channel 16 in case you sink, you phone up. You have to stand by in traffic to tell traffic where the hell you are. You have to listen to weather, weather one, weather two. Then you got your other channels. It's just nuts in that pilot house, but it's great. Now, let's look at some of the stuff here. And I'm going to show you how to capsize a boat. I know how to do it. And I know about it because uh, two years ago, a guy from Lord Bay, Chris Cook, on the West Isle, one of the stays let go, turned over capsized. Last week, my friend Bodie Wadhams on the Miss Corey capsized. Now, what the hell's going on? Well, how did he do that? Well, you have to, I guess, not pay attention. Here's what we do. Take a look. See that? That, when you pull on that, pulling on the mask, that's going to tip you over. You know your physics, don't you? High, you know, fulcrum, all that nonsense. Okay, so how did we avoid that? Well, first of all, see this guy out here? That's Derek. The, the loneliness of the skip man. He's called the tow-off man. He tows the boat out of the net. Now, you can't see it, but behind there is a bridle. 
There's a line, a disturbed bow. Well, that's a stern. <laughs> you think I'd know the different shape? <laughs> that's a stern. That's a bow. The sharp end, the right end, the pointy end is a bow. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we had a line there, and a line there, and a line up there. So, if the boat's going to list when we're lifting the fish, Derek! Derek! <laughs> He would never answer the phone, damn it. But anyhow, that would stop the boat from tilting, or listing, or capsizing, call it what you want. Now the other thing here, see all these things up here? Okay, that, there's not much fish in that net, and it doesn't matter. See this lift here, this lift, or any one of those lifts, it's going to pull the boat. So what we would do when we had heavy fish, we would only pull it up a little, so that the, we'd only use these two here. <laughs> this is the red one, and that's the yellow. Now, what else you want to know about that boat? Was it fun to fish on? Yeah. That uh, skipper, we, he made us, in 1990, cruise share was 40,000 on the salmon. Hello? <laughs> 30,000 on the herring. They were drinking whiskey. Uh, we made a lot of money. We were good at it. Also, we were bad. Very bad. Here's the other thing you need to know. We always set right-handed. Okay? Right-handed, clockwise. Drop the skiff, away you go. Always do that. The Americans set left-handed, because that's their Americans. Okay. <laughs> well, we did one time, we had the net. Everybody thought we're all going to set right-handed. We set left-handed and came around and sh bang! Hello? <laughs> we got the guy's anchor in our galley, <laughs> in the kitchen sink. So he gets mad, he backs up, pulls everything off his drum, and he's got the pouts. He's a Norwegian, so he's got the pouts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they started arguing, and then they decided, we would give him the anchor back if he fixed our window. And that was it. But we did tell that story. It's everybody in the fleet that knows. Well, that was. You know. <laughs> yeah, good old days. I, you, 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 as you can see, I miss it. I miss it terribly. Because that's all I did. That's all I know, you know? Yeah. Okay. Row fishery. Little Japanese. Moseki, Rado. It's a New Year's dish. Here's your, here's where the stuff from her, from Hornby Island goes. It goes from Hornby to Vancouver to Japan. See that? that. So this is a traditional dish at New Year's. Each one of those foods has symbol, symbolism. Harry Rowe, Kazunoko, it means many children. It's a symbol of fertility, okay? Uh, the beans, where the hell are the beans? Symbol of long life, symbol of... Uh, each one of those foods has significance. So the Japanese are like that. They... Four bucks a pound, if you had to buy it. But see, over there. Yeah. See, here's what's happened. It's expensive. Now, this was a gift you gave at New Year's. Everybody gave the gift. And it was very important, and as Mimi pointed out, the Japanese population is getting older, and they don't do this anymore. And after the death of the emperor a few years ago, it was not polite to do this anymore, to have extra consumption or extra gift giving. And so that was bang, that was the end of it. Now, people used to ask me, well, what's good about eating this stuff? Well, it's high in omega-3. Well, okay, no big deal. It's not an aphrodisiac. It will not improve your sex life. But it's good for your heart. So you won't have a heart attack while having sex. So I point that out to you that that's very important to know. Uh, yeah. uh, it's tragic. See? The row fishery is on its last legs. It's on its last legs. You know, and this year my 
really bring it all home. Okay, now, Mimi talked a lot about the Hadigwai and Rowan Kelp. Now, the reason they, I, I'm extrapolating a little here, but I come from Alert Bay, I'm allowed to say this. They like Kazunoko Kombu. Uh, Kazunoko means uh, many children, Kombu means kelp. <laughs> okay, so you look at this stuff. Now, I don't really ever, I mean lots, but I like it because it's traditional. It's like chewing on rubber. But it's got a nice salty taste from the, from the kelp. And you, uh, the kelp, well, you won't get uh, goiter. Well, you never had it before, but <laughs> you won't get it because of, uh, so this is what Mimi's talking about, the Rowan kelp. Now, again, it's a dying industry. We, a number of years ago, there used to be at least 10, 15 Rowan kelp operations. You, they work, they, they bring the, the, the herring to the pond and they spawn on the kelp. And everything was great for a while. And then the Japanese said, well, why should we compete with each other? Why don't we just centralize buying? Wham! Went the price. It's all over. They have one buyer and they set the price and they're not buying very much of it. So in spite of everyone saying, oh, let's go to Rowan Kelp, it's sustainable, great. How much of this are you going to buy? Zero. Even though it's good for your heart. <laughs> so, herring, so, herring pond, macrocystis. All right, here we are. <coughs> Declining, <coughs> no hope. <coughs> Here's a new word for you, monopsonist. That means a single body as opposed to a monopoly. So it's a sad story. So maybe the market, maybe Japan will solve the problem of the herring fishery. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, we're moving briskly along here. How are you living so far? You're okay? Everybody awake? Yeah. I'll tell you any more of your stories. You can always tell a guy from Lord Bay if you can't tell him anything. <laughs> All right, the fishing fleet, here's some of the structure. There's 250 licenses, uh, about 1,200 billnets. One company, Kent Fisco, they set the price. It's that simple. They set the price. And that's predicated on what the Japanese tell them. So the Japanese said, here's what we'll pay. Kent Fisco says, here's what we'll get, and here's what we'll pay. So we're, we're what they, we're called price takers. We have no control over the market. None. Okay. So it's an economic issue. That means monopolies. As you see, one buyer, Japan, one company, Can Fisco. The only BD pointed that out of all the licenses they have. They set price to the fishermen. They control others with mark. If you want to fish for Camp Fisco, you have to sign a marketing agreement. Translation, we'll pay you what we feel like. I mean, it's very harsh, but it's true. Okay. Now, there's some smaller guys, North Delta, uh, Leader, etc., etc. But they, they just go along with the pack. You've got one big guy and a bunch of little guys coming along. So that's how the industry is structured. One buyer, one guy of buying the fish. So it's all over. All right, the other thing I want to talk about is, and Tony, my God, Tony, you told me so much. My brain is full. <laughs> Good stuff, though. Then I will. Now, they're separate from DFO. The Nanaimo, the science people, they are separate from DFO. They do what they believe is pure research. They build the models. It's Tony, well, Tony's way ahead of them, but that's his stick. They set the population estimates, and they set the quotas. And as Tony elaborated, and I know it's true, it said, why 20% exploitation rate? Well, 20% sounds better than 18 or 21. Why not just pick 20? You can understand it. I think it's the number they picked out of the air. No basis, in fact. Well, they would argue with you, 
If you look at all these scientific papers, blah, 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 but the number just came out of the air. Okay? So, how many of that? She's <laughs> Right, for 10 grand. Wow, can you phone my daughter and tell her I'm doing okay? <laughs> okay. How do you do science? How do you build models like Tony does? Well, I call it the NEN, the the Russian secret police, I don't know what to call it, GPU or whatever they're called now, they said, bring us a prisoner and we'll find the crime. <laughs> the DFO says, give us any data and we'll get the result we want. <laughs> it's, it's totally elaborated. The only hard fact they have is the spawn deposition rates. They send divers down, maybe they're out here sometimes, I don't know if you see them here. They send the divers down and they go along and they have little bridge and they take photographs. That's hard data. The other hard data they have is what they catch. The rest of it is conjecture. Tony, work for you in your old age. Okay. Now, look at that other little thing. Woo! Play that one. See, this is going to be a great presentation when I get it tuned up. <laughs> All right. Science sets the quota. Then it goes through the mysterious process. It goes from Nanaimo, mysteriously, goes over to Vancouver. And DFO management gets to work on it. They got a number, and they said, OK, boys, let's go. And they develop all fisheries, repeat, all fisheries now have what they call an IFMP, Integrated Fisheries Management Plan. And it's uh, not some work of light fiction. <laughs> but they go through industry consultations. We'll talk about that. And then they, so they have, in the Herring, they have an advisory board called the Herring Industry Advisory Board by invitation only. You can't get on it, Grant. Too bad. Too bad. And then there's a mysterious thing called the Herring Conservation Society, which is an industry animal, and that's how they raise money for little things they want to do. At one time, they couldn't pay for the test boats. The, the test boats got paid in fish. Then they said, that's a no-no. So then they assessed every license holder, 8,000 bucks and 4,000 whatever, through this Harry Conservation Bo uh, Society to pay for the test fishery. Anyhow, jiggery pokery. OK, now we come to you. I spent 10 years as a government official in Ottawa. And to repeat, you know, it's long ago and far away, and who cares? I will not, I repeat, get one question on the 4X area panic problem. I know. But I'm a specialist in it. When I was in Ottawa, we got 6,000 letters a week on the seal hunt. We kept up the seal hunt. So, if you think you have influence, think again. Now, interestingly, I'm really pleased from Mimi's presentation to point out that the Haida Gwaii has said, we want to control our own resources. We want to do it, for whatever reason. I mean, Mimi did it in great detail. But fundamentally, that's what they're saying. And they, they've got a strong argument. They know their onions. They know what they want to do, and they've got political power. How can you go up against the Haida Gwaii nation can't. So they're going to get what they want. But they're not going to make any money on spawn on kelp. Now, what about the Hornby Conservation Society? Well, I support what you're doing because it's, in a, in a simple sense, you want to control your environment. You want to control your world. You want to control something in your life. And you want to control where you live. You know, you don't want garbage washing up on your beaches, you know, you all sorts of things you want. So, I'm coming to the end. I could tell you more. Uh, you want to hear the story about the fish buyer shot at me on Christmas Eve over the incident with his daughter? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hear it. <laughs> oh, it's still spooky. <laughs> yeah. Not when you're young, what the hell. I could have been rich. Very fish buyer's daughter. Oh my God! 
Grant knows her too. Okay. <laughs> I've been in fisheries all my life. Grew up with it. Fish. Worked as a policy guy. I have a PhD in fisheries. I'm involved with it. Blah, 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 blah. Big deal. But there's only one simple question. What is that? What are the fisheries for? That's a good question. Now, here's what happens. Everybody's got an opinion. And everybody says we should do this. Here's a fundamental flaw in this whole process. You know what it is? People argue for fishermen and little fish companies and shore workers are toast. So, how do you make the balance? I don't have the answer to that question. But it always used to irritate me that that well, in the sardine fishery and in the herring fishery, people would always have these, you know, let's shut her all down. Well, there are benefits and there are costs. So for those who ask for shutting it down, hmm, I have that criticism. Will you pay me to shut her down? Hasn't happened. But what they did in California, which is curious, they didn't like this trawl fishery, so they got together a couple million bucks, they barked the boats and burned them. That was the end of that fishery. So, you know. It goes to the larger question. Who are the stakeholders? So the stakeholders have different perspectives, different interests. The fishermen and Ken Fisco, very narrow, specific interests. Let's make money. Never mind the resource, let's make money. We'll pay lip service to it. We'll, we're in favor of sunshine and more fish and so forth. But fundamentally, we want the money. <clears throat> so that's one stakeholder. The other stakeholder is the science. If you ever want to, uh, I shouldn't upset Grant here, he's very sensitive. <laughs> but <laughs> if you go up against a profession such as biologists, like Nanaimo, they get touchy because it's their life, their models, their world, their budget, their life, their steady march to the index pension. So, they don't want to change. Same with DFO management. You know, they sit there and they've got millions of stuff coming at them. So they just take it easy. They won't do anything. It'll all go away. That's how it works. I mean, that's what I did. <laughs> so the stakeholders, the other one is the public. And slowly but surely the public is becoming aware of conservation issues or environment or climate change or whatever. Because citizens are engaged now. Before, nobody gave a damn about the herring fishery. Now, everyone's got an opinion. So how to influence the process? I have no answers. <laughs> No answers. The Heide Glyer are perhaps a good model. What Mimi showed you is maybe how it's done. But uh, just speaking as an ex bureaucrat, to influence the process, good luck. You know, good luck. Sorry, it's very cynical, but true. So the next step for Hornby, well, I leave that open. Hey, look at that. <laughs> I'm so pleased with myself. I'm not allowed to do that. My $10,000 paid off. Okay, now, I'm done. I'm done. But, 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 I wanted to take questions from the audience or more elaboration or whatever. But that's how I see it. And some of those things I've told you are perhaps not very, well, not, 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 not very nice, but not acceptable or, or cause you to think, you know, I'm, I'm I'm raining on your parade. That's <laughs> what I'm doing. I'm saying, here you got, you want to control your environment, you want to have Hornby to be a wonderful place, and one of the things you want to do is you want to come to grips with the herring thing, and I'm saying, tough, tough road ahead. But, yeah, it's a good fight. Okay. All right, you want to call my daughter and tell me that okay? <laughs>
challenges. To yeah. The difference between the regulation mm -hmm. and the enforcement, yep. or the difference yeah. between legal is a good way to go. That uh, that solves a lot of problems. Makes sense. You know, for example, like DFO used to pay the test boats in, in fish. And the guy sued said, hey, wait a minute, that belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to DFO, it belongs to everybody. So it was a legal challenge. So DFO had to set up, not DFO, the industry had to set up the, the Herring Conservation Society to get the money to pay for the test boat. But finally they changed the regulations that they could pay off in fish. But yeah, legal, way to go. Now one of the problems here in BC, Here's the fundamental problem in the treaty process. DFO will not give up the fisheries. They will not make any, <clears throat> they do a little bit. The New Chalmers, the, the people on the west coast of Vancouver Island said, hey, we had a traditional commercial fishery, so they get a little 6% or whatever. The, hey, you touched on the right thing. Legal challenges were. Thanks, Tom.